This week, the podcast is sponsored by the Imperial Bank of Botherton. If you have a mountain of gold coins looted from an unfortunately deceased goblin tribe, or a cache of valuable gems liberated from a sadly demised commune of bugbears, you'll find no better place to store it. The Imperial Bank of Botherton's vault is guarded by nuclear bear owls, and its adamantine doors are enchanted by the greatest mage in all the... Oh, wait, I think there must be an error. I'm the greatest mage in all the world. Who is, who is this pretender? Who? Who? I demand to know! All the tabletop role-play news We aim to amuse and we aim to enthuse And Morris is unofficial tabletop RPG Hello, 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 and welcome to Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG talk. I, as always, am Russ, a.k.a. Morris, or Morris, a.k.a. Russ, and with me this week is... Peace Coffee from the Southampton Guild of Role Players. Russ, as ever, it is a complete delight to be here. Peter, um, there's, there's a box in front of you. I've put a box in front of you, and I need you to put your hand in it. I'm not okay with this. <laughs> <laughs> if you remove your hand at any point during the podcast, I have instructed your cat to deliver a lethal injection. <laughs> Why is my cat in the box? This feels like Schroding has just gone very, very wrong. <laughs> you're, you're, you're Schroding a cat, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, we're, we're not alone. And, and uh, as our listeners may have guessed from that subtle clue, that little hint that I just gave, because that was, that was smooth, wasn't it, don't you think? Very we're good. doing we're doing Flash Gordon. Yes. <laughs> <Gordon's Hey! alive! laughs> wait, wait, no. <laughs> that was a tree trunk, obviously. Anyway. Uh, we have two guests this week. Two guests starting off the new year with a bang. We've got multiple Woo-hoo! guests. We have two guests. Let's, First of all, we yes. have Andy Peregrine, who's been on the show before. Yes, He's, I remember. He does lots and lots of things in the uh, role-playing game industry, but at the moment, he's head- heading up the uh, Dune, or Dune, depending on uh, how you pronounce it. Do you say Dune, or do you say Dune, Andy? I go for Dune. Dune. <laughs> I'm more of a Dune. 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 He's heading up the Dune RPG line for yeah. Modifius Entertainment. Hmm. And he's brought along a friend. What? And he has friends. <laughs> Why was I not informed? <laughs> I was told I had a plus one. <laughs> so, seems legit. I mean, I mean, maybe we should make that more of a formal thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. plus one's right. Why not? Yeah, so also we have Chris Birch, who is the head honcho over at Modifius. Oh, hello, hello. I guess that makes him, uh, that makes him Andy's boss. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, to be fair, Peter's the only one here who isn't my boss for something. <laughs> I'm sure that could be arranged. Well, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do, do you need anything done, Peter? Do you need any design work? Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. you're king of podcasts, so that, there you go. Everyone's my boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll talk all about June shortly, but for now, shall we dive into some tabletop RPG news? Oh yes, let's. Actually, June's in the first bit of tabletop RPG news. It's, it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh. So. A week ago, or was it two weeks ago? I can't remember because all the days are the same now. But recently, uh, mm. the top 10 most anticipated tabletop RPGs of 2021 were announced. Oh, exciting. So I thought we could very quickly shoot through those. Yeah. We've got no idea what the winner was here on this podcast. It's going to be a complete surprise to all of us. Are we all waiting with anticipation and bated breath? It's actually going to be a surprise to me because I don't know what you're talking about. Do you not? Well, oh, I, okay. I know I know of the poll. I know that there were some results, but I didn't actually see the results. I voted for you're, you're about to find out. <gasps> so we had over 10,000 votes on this one, which mm-hmm. is the most we've had any year so far. They're going up each year, this thing. Mm-hmm. So it's getting, quite, it's getting quite popular. Nice. Um, and what it is is uh, the most anticipated tabletop RPGs for the coming year. Yes. Uh, so the, the basic rules are the release date has, at least theoretically, got to be in the coming year. Nah. So in 2021. Release and, date, so it happens. Yeah, and uh, it's fan-nominated. So I open mm. the floor to, uh, to nominations. Any fans nominate a game that they're looking forward to, and then we go through a big um, voting period. So fan-nominated, games of 2021. Yes. 
So previous winners, uh, we've had Thirteenth Age, we've had yes. Star Wars, Force and Destiny, we've had Rifts for Savage Worlds, Trotvang Chronicles, Vampire the Masquerade Fifth Edition, Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, and last year it was Dune <laughs> Adventures in the Imperium Ooh. in 2020, the most anticipated <laughs> game of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and now let's find out what the most anticipated game of 2021 is <laughs> so I'll, I'll count down them very quickly we'll just like do like a few seconds on each we won't spend long on this so okay. number 10 was Slay Industry 2nd Edition oh, coming from nice. Nightfall Games mm. Scottish publisher it's a what, 25 year old game I think oh at least oh yeah 2nd uh, uh, yeah. Edition sort have, of, have um, we all played Slay Industries I have Claire. actually several times very yeah, exciting Claire. Yeah. Yes, well, Dave's a I, friend of mine as well, so I've I played it with Dave. Yeah, so I, I have yeah. it, but I haven't played it. In fact, mm. I, I, I don't think you'd mind me sharing this story. I know that Dom of Cubicle 7 actually bunked off school to buy it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, nice. uh, that was his, so it's one of his favourites as well, because of course Cubicle Fair 7 di- uh, was doing it for a little while as well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, should we go on to number nine? No, yes. Number nine is Werewolf the Apocalypse 5th Edition. Ooh. I am utterly confused about the whole um, who's producing, who's licensing, who's doing what for Border <laughs> Darkness. I, I literally have no idea. I think this is Renegade Studios and Paradox. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah okay. it's, it's, it's. I think it's back with back with them now, and uh, I'm looking forward to Werewolf if it does as well as uh, Vampire Five. Um, yeah. I'm right. a big fan of Vampire Five. Mm. So. Exactly. so number eight. Number eight is a Spanish, uh, Italian even, RPG, uh, called uh, Brancoloni or Brancolonia? Brancolonia? Oh, yeah, Brancolonia. How, do you pr- how do you pronounce a C in, in Italian? Is it a hard C? Like, is it a hard C? Brancolonia? 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 They're, they're going to hate us when they listen to this. I don't think they're listening to us. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, It's a spaghetti fantasy RPG. So it's yes. Italian, it's kind of medieval, mm-hmm. and it's uh, being released in Italian and English. Ooh. And uh, they've, they've come up with this new fantasy genre, which mm. is like a spaghetti western with swords instead of guns. Yeah. Mm. I guess it's, oh, it's, it's Mandalorian is basically spaghetti sci-fi western, isn't it? So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. Like yeah. Kind of, I think Firefly kind of was as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. the, the yeah. thing I looked down the list and went, oh, another fantasy setting, then went spaghetti western. Ooh, yeah, <laughs> I can be interested now. So, yeah, it work. Mm. Now, this is also kind of based on Italian folklore history and pop culture, so it might be a bunch mm. of stuff we're not quite as familiar with. Yeah. Maybe. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Okay. In at number seven, Pinnacle yes. Entertainment Group are producing oh. Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. <laughs> so we yes. talked about this before in the podcast. They announced yes. it in November on Thanksgiving in America. Yes. They then a month later announced that they'd made an announcement which was highly entertaining. <laughs> I, it, it's certainly a different take on, rather than doing like a teaser for a trailer for an announcement, like, ah, oh, we've announced it. Oh, oh, by the way, guys, guys, we've made an announcement. Heads up. It's important. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there's not much to say about that. It's, part, yeah. it's Pathfinder for Savage Worlds. It's a uh, Kickstarter coming this month, and the game is apparently coming out quarter four, 2021. All right. Okay. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Uh, but we, we've got them on in... Next week, I think. Yeah, next couple of weeks. Next week. Next yeah. week. Yeah. So we can we can talk to them all about that then. Yeah. Uh, next, number six, Chaosium, yeah. Rivers of London. Ooh, get in. So this was on the list last year. Yes. And it was on number seven last year, so it's gone up to number six Ooh. this year. Okay. That's one I'm looking forward to as well. I've, I've not yet read the books, but uh, everyone is talking about those. So. I just started the audio book of the first one because Peter kept telling me that I had to. So I finally Look. have. I'm going to say Cobner Holbrook Smith does an amazing rendition of the books. Like, so I you see the narrator the on that. He, he is, he is the, he is the narrator. Yeah. And right. like I say, it's at points, I just forget that there is actually just one of him. Yeah. He's good with accents, isn't he? Yeah. He's, a, he, he's not just good. He's amazing. I'm like, mm. oh, okay. Oh, actually, there is just one person doing all the voices. <laughs> yeah. It's very, right. very good. Number five. Yeah. It's us, EN publishing in with level up advanced fifth edition. Well, I don't imagine listeners to this podcast need to be told what that is because I never stop talking about it. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, current working subtitle, Advanced Fifth Edition. Yeah. Yes, the clue's in the title anyway, isn't it? I, I, yeah. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure we haven't had another four editions, but maybe I've just missed that. That's entirely possible. <laughs> anyway. <Okay>. Number four. <laughs> yes. Chaosium with their second entry in the list. Uh, King Arthur, Pendragon, Sixth Edition. 
Nice. Oh, very so, much looking forward to that one. So, yeah. like, 5th edition came out not that long ago, but this 6th edition has apparently been a decade in the making. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think this is basically all the amendments Greg Stafford wanted to make. Right. It's, oh. it's like his final at magnum opus for, you yeah. know, I mean... Pendragon was always he kind of thing. famously says that Pendragon yeah. is his masterpiece, doesn't he? That's yeah. his, uh, right. yeah. And I think this is like the final notes from basically the master of game design, frankly, because yeah. Pendragon yeah. is, I would argue, one of the most perfect systems ever made. Again, um, I haven't played it, but I do it have it upstairs. Well, well, I, I will go on at great length about Pendragon's. Um, just the way it works. Is but I'd have to stop brilliant. you talking about Seventh Sea yeah. first. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's well. <laughs> stop. Seventh Sea is the best setting ever made. Red Dragon is the best system ever made. <laughs> so we're in, we're in Seventh Sea using Red Dragon. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. number three. Yeah. Yeah. Free League are in with the One Ring Second Edition, taking Ooh. over the franchise from Cubicle Seven. Um, they're updating the One Ring and Adventures in Middle Earth, and they're producing Moria: The Long Dark, which is an adventure mm. for the game. Uh, this sounds exciting. Yeah, I mean, but uh, I, I'm confused and slightly shocked, a little embarrassed. But I, where's all the games from Modiphius? <laughs> Modiphius never makes it into these games. You know, <laughs> Modiphius don't make games. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't make games. <laughs> you're thinking of more dice for us. That's an entirely different. Oh, game. Dice for us. Yes. <laughs> I remember them well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we're up to number one now because there's a joint winner. Now, oh. bear in mind, I said there yes. were thousands of votes. Yes. You said about ten. Thousand, I am. I am not lying when I say both of these two got the exact same number of votes when the poll closed. Nice. Wow. So the poll was set automatically to close at a certain time. It's not like I was sitting there waiting for the votes to level out and then closing it. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. was set to close at a specific time. And Morris, it did can you say r- roughly how many are there in between the top ten? Like, is it hundreds yeah. or tens? Or because uh, it might be interesting for you know, should mm. people be doing more? Like, if they. Only got another fifty to hundred people to vote. Would it? Would it count? Mm. Would so it the difference? top, the top two were yeah. uh, a couple of hundred beyond the next batch. Yeah. And yeah. Then the next three or four were very, very close. They were like within fifty of each other. Really? And then they started getting more spread out. So it that. is worth people really pushing their fan bases to to vote. Yeah, yeah. if yeah. they yeah. don't yeah. already. Yeah. Just so one shall- more spam email would have made. <laughs> 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 Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the fact that you, you, these two um, com- currently completely unknown games, which I haven't measured yet, um, mm-hmm. got exactly the same number of votes after a week and a half of voting and mm-hmm. thousands and thousands of votes. I just think this is such a weird, weird coincidence. I mean, if yeah. it had gone on for another minute, yeah. possibly one of these w- would have edged ahead, but it yeah. didn't. So hit, the very yeah. course got of history would have changed. Now get went, on with yeah. it. Tell us what well, it is. I, but I was only putting in multiple votes till that number, so that would that wouldn't. Have, uh, no, you can't change the system because. Okay, so which which order should I do these in? Alphabetical order by company or alphabetical order by game name? Oh, I don't mind. I, game name. I think I think by company. Uh, <laughs> All right. We'll do, that then, we'll do that then, <laughs> shall we? Have? We'll do that then, shall we? Have? All right. Then. So, by company yeah. in reverse, in reverse alphabetical order, you said did you? <laughs> <laughs> was was Free League's Twilight Two Thousand. Oh yes, so that's the one about the Third World War that never happened yeah. in the post-apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, this is Free I'd... League's second entry on the list because obviously <laughs> they had the One Ring a little earlier. Yeah. Mm-mm. So, that, so they and Chaosium are both in there twice, mm-hmm. which is pretty impressive. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so Twilight um, 2000 is like a, a Poland devastated by war, but this game apparently has an alternative Swedish setting as well, as well as tools for placing mm. this game anywhere yeah. in the world. Nice. Uh, it, yeah, I remember playing this one in the back in the eighties, and uh, it's just brilliant. Yeah, uh, it's just that, you know because it's nice. It has the, there has been, I think, a very limited nuclear exchange, but mm. really just everything's yeah. kind of fallen apart enough that you're a bit lost in Europe and you don't know where your unit is. Yeah, but not mm. so much. There's no chain of command and it's all gone post-apocalypse. Yeah, and, uh, and you've so one of the things you've got to do is you know you've got to find food and petrol to get your vehicles and things where you're mm. going and things like mm-hmm. that. Well, sounds so just enough. like just like normal life, actually. Yeah. 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 That's, that's twenty twenty then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember well, this. What, what, what are we petrol? Like I'm going anywhere in my car. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. not happening. Yeah. Shall we find out what the other joint number one was? 
Well, I don't know. Ooh. It's like been 10, 15 minutes. Or should we just stop there? Maybe we should just like... Okay. We've had eight number one. We don't need two number ones, do we? <laughs> oh, <my> tea. <laughs> such a tease. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any you getting to the point at any point? <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. The friend's me. <laughs> so the <laughs> other number one. For the, the one. second year in a row. Yes. Was a oh. <laughs> company called Modifius Entertainment. Is that like more dice for us? The a bit like that, yeah. 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 Uh, producing, a game each other. <laughs> <laughs> producing a game called Dune or Dune, depending how you like to pronounce it, Adventures in the Imperium. Oh. So this well is done. the third time in the chart and the second time at number one. Yes. So well, congratulations. That does answer my question, where's Modifius yeah. in all of this? Is yes. that number one? Yeah, it's so, right there. Well the time we are. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So um, I, I assume most people know what Dune is, and we're going to be talking about it a lot later. But Dune is basically, uh, how, how would you very, very quickly sort of give the elevator pitch for what Dune actually is? Well, it's, uh, it's a very, very far in the future science fiction setting. So you're talking tens of thousands of years. Uh, it has a sort of feudal Game of Thrones style feel to it because the universe is ruled by uh, individual houses who mm-hmm. all own their own planet to a certain degree and held together by a uh, an emperor who manages a... Well, no, he doesn't manage. There is a, a, a guild of space navigators that keeps the whole thing together. But uh, the main thing that keeps everything together is this substance called spice. Is found on only one planet in the entire universe, and pretty much every faction and uh, and power block in the Empire needs it for something. It can extend your life, uh, possibly even doubling your lifespan if you take it regularly. It can, uh, and it give you prescient visions if you have the right skills to make use of it. Uh, and the Imperium relies on it, but it's only in one place, hmm. and, uh, and that's where all the power lies. But of course, this place is not a very pleasant planet. It's a vast desert. Uh, great worms will swallow anything that comes across the desert, and the place itself will kill you if you, if you let it. So uh, it's not a place many people want to go, but it's a place everyone wants to control. Hmm. First spice, it must flow. Yeah. So I, I, was, I was telling Peter before the before the show that um, Peter is a fan of Dune and he's is he's very familiar with it. I'm not I'm not so familiar with it. I haven't seen the film. I've seen maybe bits of it occasionally on TV, but I haven't actually seen the film and I haven't read the book. But what I do know is there are giant worms and I know that Sting wears his underpants, which uh, yeah. which is more than enough, I think, to, to fill a film. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the two most phallic objects are connected in your mind, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, to be honest, the book doesn't focus on the underpants as much as you might expect. Does it not? <laughs> you know, I, no, I, 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 de- I didn't recall mm. it, but I thought, well, maybe I've just been confused. So I <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, and it's got Patrick Stewart in it as well, hasn't it? He, yeah, yeah. He, it, you've it got to compare because he doesn't age between that and Star Trek. I think yes, so. I it's, know. Right, very much. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So it's quite quite crazy. Although he has started to age a bit now in Picard, who is starting to show a bit finely. But after yeah, after about forty years, finally he's getting a couple of wrinkles. Yeah, yeah, he's he's run out of spice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Right uh, what's it? David Lynch film? Cut it down from ten hours to two for the theatrical release. Yeah. I thought it made a lot of sense myself, but apparently a lot of people found it quite confusing. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, I, I would recommend as well the Sci-Fi Channel ser- mini series because mm. they got as far as doing the third, but the one three-part series yeah. is the first book. And yeah. then the second three-part series is the second and third book. Mm. Yeah, um, it goes into more detail, doesn't it? Yeah. So, which is good. Definitely, mm, yeah. definitely was worth watching. Well, it's the effects watch- aren't as high budget as the movie, mm. but they're. Um, but it's yeah, it's, it tells you a lot more of the story. Which I'll is definitely good. watch the new film. That's, is that this year the new film? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's yeah, it will be this year now. I think it's back. Mm. The uh, Denis Villeneuve's movie is, is. Yeah. I think it's now in October. Uh, but uh, yes, that was. Yeah, because the trailer for that looked awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it does amazing. Hmm. Yes, we, we've seen some extra bits and we're still excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen anything of the movie itself, obviously, no. but no. we've we've been privy to a couple of of extra details, and yeah. uh, it's just wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's stunning. 
Right, let's quickly finish the news. There isn't a massive yeah. amount of news because it's been Christmas and it's been New Year and not a lot of news comes out over that period. So mm-hmm. um, we can probably whip through this quite quickly. Uh, there has been uh, not an announcement, but a sort of leak of an announcement of a new D&D book. Yay. <laughs> yeah, well, I, just, I just love all this extra content that they like to throw out there. As well. so it's like, <gasps> we, we're going to tell you something, but not yet. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, to, to be fair, this this wasn't um, Wizards of the Coast themselves. This is one of those things where Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Penguin House have like um, uh, uh, mm-hmm. what you call it, a Website? placeholder page. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you can get a little bit of information from it, but basically the information you can get is this book, whatever it is, is mm-hmm. going to be announced on Tuesday, January the twelfth. Yeah. Okay. So we could talk about it next week when we find out what it is. It's mm-hmm. going to be released on March the sixteenth. Okay. And it will cost forty nine ninety nine US dollars. Yeah. And that's basically all we know. Uh, I, I, I mean, it just feels a bit... Uh, based like- on just that information, it's actually started climbing the Amazon bestseller charts as well. <laughs> and pretty yeah. Based on just that. <laughs> We're not saying people are desperate for content, but... Um, <laughs> but yeah. it's, just, it's just like it keeps on being leaked on Amazon. And it's like, okay, one leak... Sure, two leaks maybe, but it's like it keeps happening again and again and again. It's like, oh, well, you know. yeah. isn't this the usual thing as as we know as publishers that when you have to announce your stuff to the distribution network before yeah, you're ready to I, announce I think, it to the public, yeah. and then someone sees it on Amazon and goes, "I found secret information," and it's like, well, that has, isn't actually. It just means they've got more of the hopeful dates, but it's nothing guaranteed. And, yeah, um, well, and suddenly yeah. people run with it. But yeah. well, there's quite a bit of speculation on this one. Mm-hmm. Because last year, Wizards of the Coast, uh, they said uh, three classic settings were going to get active attention over the next year or two. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of speculation that this book, this upcoming book, is going to be a classic setting. No guarantee. It's just, you know, it's all speculation. Nobody knows anything. But they did say the coming years will have a greater emphasis on settings in general. And mm-hmm. there's going to be more anthologies and there's going to be more of those Magic the Gathering collaborations. So, spell drama confirmed. Fantastic. Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah or, <laughs> or, or not. I, yeah. <laughs> Who I knows? thought I'd seen Dark Sun as a rumour, but that's not. So. <laughs> well, I think everything has been rumoured. Yeah. You know. yeah. Never know. And, and of course, Wizard wow. of the Coast has recently settled that Dragonlance lawsuit with Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. So I'm wondering if that was settled to get some but stuff set, out of the way. Settled was a strong word. They've voluntarily redrawn it whilst exercising the right to refile at a later date. Yeah. It's my I'm understanding. Just, uh, settled, yeah. settled isn't the word I would use. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I'm assuming there was some interaction between them and Wizards of the Ghost. I don't know. Yeah. So yeah. obviously talking. They've figured yeah. out a deal and yeah. it's, they're well, doing kind. a deal. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And Margaret, Weiss, tell, I guess. Margaret Weiss did tweet at the time there was exciting news in the weeks to come. And mm-hmm. these are the weeks to come. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, it would be nice to see Dragon Lance. And a new D&D back. book yeah. is exciting mm-hmm. news. So who knows? Who knows? Maybe. I'd be really yeah. happy if it was Dragon Lance. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why, that's the thing I'd like it to be most of all. Yeah, it's a great setting. Hmm. Right. Let's quickly crack on with the news because we've got a little bit of Pathfinder news. Uh, Ooh, there's okay. a new uh, Pathfinder 2 playtest out. Ooh. And that is for two new classes. Mm-hmm. They pre announced this announcement. Oh. <laughs> that does seem to be a theme, doesn't it? <laughs> it's our favourite thing. Br- announcements of announcements. We love them. Yeah, it's mm. the best thing about being on a news show, talking about announcements of things that they're going to talk about at some point. Yeah. It's, it's super exciting, I've got to say. Yeah. <laughs> I might take See the enthusiasm on yeah. Peter's face yeah. um, <laughs> But But, but we've, got, we've, we've got the actual playtest now. So this is a playtest for two classes, and they yeah. are the Gunslinger mm-hmm. and the Inventor. Oh. So the gunslinger has been in Pathfinder before, uh-huh. but the inventor is brand new. Ooh. And they describe the inventor as master gadgeteers, uh, mechanical devices. You can influence the direction of a flight and leverage powerful innovations to deal out devastating attacks or transform yourselves into unbreakable armored bulwarks. Bulwarks. How's that bulwarks. word pronounced? Bulwarks. 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 Wow. Yes. Oh, anyone else got an answer on that? I'm saying bulwarks because I've never heard it. Anyone else say it? I've so. never, I've never heard that word said out loud before. I've read it. I'm, I'm staying out of all pronunciation. <laughs> <discussions. laughs> Solid choice. Yeah, 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 it's safe. 
<laughs> somebody, somebody will come back with it in like 10 years' time. You didn't know how to pronounce bulwarks. If right. at some point you could tell us a little more, that would be awesome. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm trying to shoot through the news pretty quickly, so let's have a look what else we've got. We yeah. have got... Oh, yeah. So, it was my anniversary That's... the other day. Happy anniversary. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Uh, the 20-year anniversary of my yeah. website. Ah, yes. There we go. Wow, amazing. 20... Yes. That's incredible, isn't it? 20 years. years. Good Lord. <laughs> God, that's a, I must have started doing it when I was one year old then. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. 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 Totally explains it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, there was another bit of news. The Terminator RPG. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. You can download the Quick Start. Ooh. So that was released just before New Year, mm-hmm. right, right at the end of 2021. Uh, and the Kickstarter campaign is apparently going to be in early 2021. Mm-hmm. And this game, you can download the Quick Start for yep. free. Mm-hmm. And the game includes uh, rules and scenarios to play both in the future and the present day of the movies. And you mm-hmm. can also play in other different time periods as well, because there's time travel, all the different Terminators, uh, different mm-hmm. enemy types, and all the different characters that in the movies and the comic books, apparently. Mm-hmm. So you play as a group of Terminators travelling back in time to stop this middle some Sarah Connor woman. Yes. Yeah. Nice. That's exactly how I would play it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it does look interesting. It was kind of the surprise um, announcement that suddenly disappeared. Mm. It's like, what? How have we not heard that someone's got a Terminator light? Mm. And it was suddenly just pinged up there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I believe same people as Slay Industries, isn't it? It's Nightfall Games, I think, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, I'd be, I'm very interested to see that yeah. one. I think well, I, he, I downloaded the, the quick start. I don't think I've had a proper read yet. Yeah. But it does look very interesting. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can find anything else to put in the news. I think we might be done. Unless anyone can think of anything I've missed. Well, I just finished my Kickstarter. You all know that one. <laughs> yeah, you should have come on during the Kickstarter. But I, I didn't know, actually, I, I I actually realise you were having one until it came up on our show. <laughs> and it was like, oh, it's almost over. Yeah. No, it was, it was a bit of a shame. I, it was all a bit uh, last minute for me because it's one of those games I've I've had on my back barn at Burner for about the last 20, nearly 30 years. Or mm. uh, and then I just, when the lockdown hit, I just sat down and finished it mm. um, and uh, powered through it. And it's like, right, I know, I'm getting the Kickstarter out and do it. It did it well, though, didn't it? I did yeah. right, yes. I um, doubled up. I nearly doubled up my, my target. And mm. uh, I got a pretty decent showing. It didn't set the world on fire, but it's, uh, I think it was... Uh, it's made all its stretch goals and everything. Yeah. So, so yeah. Congratulations. I'm just glad to see it out there. Yeah. So, uh, talk, talking of Kickstarters, I've got one running right now, actually. Ooh. Enchanted Great. Trinkets 2. Enchanted yeah. Trinkets 2. So it's another one yeah. of my little mini quick starters. So you have to get in on them really quick. Because they well, yeah, only last you. a few days to, to, to two weeks, this one is, I think. Uh, and this one's doing really well as well. Uh, and it's a sequel to 65 Enchanted Trinkets. So it's basically a whole bunch of minor magical items you can stick in your D&D campaign, but they're not going to break the campaign or suddenly make your characters really powerful or anything like that. They're just, they're like flavorful and they kind of spice up and add color to your, to your sort of magical world. Mm. Cool. Right. So that's, that, it. That's, that's it. That's it. Tem- We've done the news. me more. That's the, the more the sort of magic item I'm usually into. So. Oh, do you yeah. want me to talk more about it? I mean, I, I'm yeah. happy to talk. Yeah. I mean, we could just make this a podcast about my Kickstarter, if you like. I'm happy to do that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. we, we, we could, but like, do you actually know what any of the magic items are? <laughs> I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you one of them is quite good. Okay. Um, so okay. there's this uh, section in there called Zlick Willie's Wily Wares, which is a collection of magical japes and tricks. So there's, there's basically a compilation of five articles, um, five little mini supplements. And the fifth one, the last one, is a kind of light-hearted one. And one of the items in there is an invisible dog leash. Is this a leash for dogs that are invisible? Yes. Or is the leash itself yes. invisible? Both. Oh, both are invisible. <laughs> okay. Right. An invisible dog leash for invisible mm. dogs. Yes. Marvellous, marvellous. Uh, who doesn't okay. want an invisible dog leash? Why not? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, possibly a dog. Yeah. To, <laughs> someone who wants to be able to find their dog leash in a hurry. I don't know. It's like yeah. it's time to play our favourite game. It's time to play the game. Our favourite game in all the world. Guess the game started from just the name. Shall we play right. our favourite game in all the world? 
Yes, let's. The, ga- the game where mm. I read out the name of a Kickstarter and you try and guess oh. what it is from just the name. Very nice. So, cr- Chris, Chris looks nervous. <laughs> 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 it's more fun than it sounds. <laughs> so we'll just do one each because there's three of you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you like to go first, Peter? I shall go first to show everyone how not to do it. Yes. Okay. So it's an so, RPG product. Russ is going to give me just the name, and then I am going to say what I think it is. Yes. So this one is called. No. It's got one of those words that I have to pronounce, and I'm going to say it wrong. Calum. Colon, a shattered sky, but Calum might not be Calum. It's C A E L U M. Calum? Calum, a shattered Salem? sky. I don't think Salem. I don't think Calum. Mm. Anyway, mm. that's, that's why I don't get into pronunciation. <laughs> Solid so, so choice. Yes. Yeah, so. so, Peter, what do you mm. think that is? Mm, I think uh, Calum is a place. It feels like if the game with a shattered sky, then I am shooting for a sort of... It feels quite diesel punk to me for some reason. I'm not sure. It implies that there's been some sort of reality bending apocalypse or a major event. Which, well, maybe not apocalypse, but world changing event, which has led to the sky being shattered. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'm... Mm, I don't. I don't have a lot to go on because I don't really know what the roots of Calum are. But I think Calum is a place within the setting, and that you've got, um, yeah, definite diesel punk five. Don't know why, uh, and some sort of altered reality. Do you like to uh, hazard a guess at a system? Well, aren't basically seven out of ten Kickstarters are setting for five E these days? Nine anyway. out of 10, <laughs> so, <laughs> that, that is playing the odds, but I'm yeah. going to say Savage Worlds. <laughs> oh, good, good second choice. Good. No, good. I haven't yeah. heard it's anything a, from Savage Worlds for a while. It's a good guess. You should have gone with D and D Fifth Edition because this isn't yeah. 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 a yeah. campaign set for D and D Fifth Edition. Um, interestingly, yeah. it's called Shattered Sky. But I think it's slightly the opposite of that. It's a 5 campaign setting where the mm-hmm. inhabitants destroyed the surface of the world okay. and then fled to live about gargantuan war machines left over from the conflict. So it's a sky world. It's like water world in the uh, in the sky. Wow. So it's like a shattered earth rather than a sky. Oh, I think sky, I've seen it? this. Yeah. Oh. I kind of like the idea. So it's an entire world just kind of set in, in the clouds, yeah. in the air, basically. Yeah, isn't it? Sky ships flying between them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that sounds kind of fun. Yeah, um, the, has it got a diesel punk vibe to it, Chris? I don't really think so, no. I think, uh, think it, I think it was more fantasy. Yeah, mm. yeah. Fantasy in the sky. Yeah. yeah, no yeah. Sorry, Peter, you got no points there at all. <laughs> <laughs> not a single, <laughs> not even a single hint of a point there. Not not even for guessing that the world had been broken, fair enough. But you, you, you said the sky had been broken. Or did you say the world had been broken? Yes. <laughs> I got call in the referee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who would like yeah, to go fine. next? I'll have a go. Okay. Yeah, I'll okay, it. Chris. I like, I like the I like the, uh, I like the title of this one. Mm. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. What is the monsters are our heroes? Monsters are our heroes. It sounds kooky and fun. <laughs> hmm. So I figure it's a card game. I'm, I'm think, yeah, think a card game. Uh, just so you know, these you, are all RPGs, all RPGs. Oh, are they? Oh, yeah. oh right, yes. okay, fine. So what you actually want is system then. Uh, the monsters, actually, no, this does ring a bell now. Uh, the monsters are our heroes. Uh, I think it is a indie RPG where you play the monsters, um, fighting back against unjust humans out to establish uh, McDonald's in your... <laughs> In your caves, systems. <laughs> okay. Um, pretty good. Pretty good. So, uh, what this is, is an OSR game. Uh, you do play the monsters. The monsters yeah. in question are the classic Halloween monsters of the public domain. So, ah, like, okay. uh, mummies and vampires and werewolves and um, Frankenstein's monster-type creatures, things like that. Yes. I um, like how they establish public domain, no intellectual property. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd be free. And, and it's set in the US, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and it's set in 2021, and you hunt down other monsters. Uh, it is, as you said, an indie game, so it's only like ten dollars for um, for the print copy. Oh. Is that is that cheap? It's really cheap, actually. Ten dollars for the print yeah, copy. Good, yeah. That's really good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's an OSL game. So yeah, I give you oh, say ninety seven points out of a hundred, there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I set the bar now. Yeah. The only, the only yeah. thing yeah. you got wrong was that um, the, the 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 people were the monsters were fighting against McDonald's when in fact they're fighting against other monsters. Wait, yes. wait, wait! <laughs> <laughs> I oh, think yes. you did get that completely yeah. right. <laughs> I think that's actually a hundred points. No, bro. Hmm. Right. Okay. So that leaves you, Andy. So Chris has a hundred points. Peter has zero points. Well, I'm I'm confident of second position, uh, second place in this one. (laughs) (laughs) Not a hundred percent confident, obviously. But uh, (laughs) Uh, let's spoken like someone who's never scored a million minus a million or been scored by Russ. I Mm. think. Right. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Right. Okay. This one is called Scourge of Shiran. S H I R A N. Well, I I have to go with my previous first guess and say that it's clearly a five E setting. But uh, although you might not have doubled up on those, uh, that sounds to me very Conan. So I'm going going to say it's a sort of barbarian horde type world, um, probably low magic, um, with lots of people scourging each other and and uh, presumably either working for or fighting against Ziran, whoever they might be. <laughs> she ran. <laughs> and, uh, um, so this is a D&D 5th edition, as you said. It's an adventure module, and ah. it's set in Storm Bunny Studios' World of Alessia campaign setting, huh. which I'm not totally familiar with, so I'm going to have a look. So it's a 5e compatible, educationally themed Science fiction adventure in the world of Alessia, powered by D and D Fifth Edition. Ooh. Interesting. What do they mean by educationally themed? I'm going got to, to do your chemistry homework. I'm going to, to, to dive in combat. and have a look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What does what does that mean? Maybe um, every every skill test is a uh, is a chemistry uh, equation <laughs> to solve. <laughs> well, Ooh, one might we argue every to make it work. Yeah. Nice. Um, so one might argue every skill test in D and D is a maths equation. So that- <laughs> that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So the Game Academy is an educational non-profit organization committed to the social, emotional and academic success of learners of all ages through the use of tabletop role playing games and live action role play. So they provide provide collaborative storytelling experiences and classes and summer camps. And they're based in the San Francisco Bay area. Right. There you go. That's what it means by educational. Um, they've That's been good. running programs since 2016. That's certainly worth supporting, yeah. Right. Hmm. Well, that looks quite cool. They have an adventure gaming summer camp, spring break oh, wow. mini camps, game master training and certification programs. Mm. Ooh, I'm not a certifi- certified game master. I mean, neither as oh, well. Dear. <laughs> Oh, we are allowed to run stuff, aren't we? No, no, no. Are we not? Oh, God. I mean, well, like, quite frankly, I run pirate it, games myself. It's like, yeah, it's, no trace of certification. No it, is it chance. my fault for not offering that to the players, or is it the players' fault for not asking to see my certification? Well, like, I'm sure oh. now they've heard this uh, heard this podcast, they'll be asking quick sharp. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the cat is out of the bag now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I will give you. Oh, I can't give you many points for that, Andy. Oh, I mean, you, you did better than zero. Yeah, can and, you give me any points? Well, you can got you, you, any you, points. You get one I'm point for guessing that. that it's D&D for the edition. Second place. Win. Two points for guessing. <laughs> oh no, you said it was a setting, and it's more. It's an adventure. Oh, I think. I think it's got to be one. Am point. I likely to get another ninety-nine points out of this? <laughs> if if not, I'll stick with the one the and odds, I'm the fine. The odds are slim. <laughs> <laughs> Since the one is fine, then. That just puts me neatly in second. It gives you a silver um, medal, at least. Yeah. Yes, I'll take silver. Yeah. yeah. So, so in, in gold, in pole yeah. position, in, with the gold medal is Chris yeah. Birch. In, in second place with the silver medal, <laughs> uh, one point is Andy Peregrine. And then, unfortunately, and you did get the hardest one, Peter, to be fair, and you did go first. Uh, but with zero points... Which is technically a bronze medal still, so you still get a medal. Well done. 
Of our favourite game in all the world. All right, Rufus, I'm ready. Backpack packed, sword sharpened, and my armour is polished to perfection. I can't wait to start this new adventure. Sorry, Jerry, but I have some bad news. The Duke has just announced another lockdown. Oh, no. That pesky goblin pox. Will it never end? According to the chief alchemist, cases are on the rise again. We must all do our part. Yes, yes, well, I'd better get my plague mask out again. Thought I'd seen the last of that. Luckily, we're permitted to leave the house for essential purchases, such as juniper berries and roses to stuff in our plague masks. <sighs> it's been so long since we went adventuring. I know, Jerry, but as you say, we must all do our part. According to the Royal Blood Letter, the Goblin Pox is transmitted through physical proximity. Yep, yep. So we mustn't get too close to each other. That's why my plate mask has a six-foot beak. Can't be too careful. Most wise, Jerry. Most wise. I wish everybody was so responsible. Yeah, I hate those anti-beakers. Look, if you must go out, wear your plague beak. It's not too much to ask, is it? And, if I may say so, remarkably fetching. Really? Oh, yes, that plague beak absolutely brings out your eye colour. Oh, why, thank you, Rufus. Oh, I wish we could go adventuring. Can we not even go out with our plague beaks on? Sorry, Jerry, adventuring isn't on the list of key workers. Only the most essential professions are allowed to go out to work. Right, right, the butchers, the bakers and the candlestick makers. Yes, yes, of course. Oh, are we going to join in with the Clap the Clerics this evening? Oh, absolutely. It's important we show them how much we appreciate them. Yes, I hear they prefer that to us paying them properly or providing them with decent plague beaks. I don't know about you, but I'd take applause over gold and life-saving protective gear any time. Me too. So, what does the chief astrologer say? He predicts the plague will last for another three months. Huh, and the soothsayer in chief? Same. All the pseudo-scientific experts are in agreement... But I saw a fella on the street corner who had alternative pseudoscientific opinions. Uh, Was he a qualified pseudoscientist? An alchemist or a dowser? I don't think so. Ah, a numerologist or a planner of ley lines? No, he's just an ear candler, I think. (laughs) An ear candler. Look, you've got to follow the pseudoscience, my friend. An ear candler on a soapbox is no replacement for a solid grounding in superstition. True enough, Jerry, true enough. Well... At least they've come up with a curative ritual for it. Yep, they're rolling it out across the Empire as we speak. Uh, Where do we get it? Oh, there's a strict order of priority. First, it's the Duke. Oh, of course, of course. Followed by the Duke's family and friends. Naturally, very, very sensible. Then the Duke's family's friends. Right. And the Duke's friends' families. Uh, This all sounds most scientific. Then it's the rich and powerful in that order. As it should be. The elf workers, followed by the health workers. Excellent. Those on the Duke's Christmas card list, the nobility, notable bards and poets, playoffs with a hundred more sonnets, and then people over the age of 90. Right. Well, I guess being fit and healthy, young, plague beak wearing adventurers, we're pretty far down the list. Well, it makes sense, doesn't it? Anyway, mustn't grumble. Fancy heading down to the cellar to kill some rats. Oh, yeah. Hey, so Peter, I was uh, I was walking down the road the other day and uh, I saw this bunch of really cool, good-looking people. Cool, good-looking. That could only be our patrons. Yep. Man, I have never seen such a well-informed debonair bunch in all my life. Yeah, right. You know, why is that? I don't know. You tell me. Well, if I was forced to speculate, I guess it's because they listen to our top-secret, super-exclusive bonus episode every week. Bonus episode? What? Yeah. Each week, our patrons get an extra half hour or even more of extra content that nobody else gets to hear. Wow, that's amazing. Where can they find this? Oh, it's pretty simple. You just head over to patreon.com slash morris and pledge a monthly donation. Anything from a dollar to whatever you think we're worth. I did a uh, a scientific calculation once just to see how much we're worth. Oh, yeah. How much? Uh, You probably don't want to know. 
probably for the best. Anyway, if you, if you enjoy our podcast, please head on over to patreon.com slash Morris and, you know, just pledge a little. That's patreon.com slash Morris. And thank you so much for your support. We couldn't do this without you. I reckon we could. Shh. Right then, June, the most anticipated tabletop, or the joint most anticipated tabletop RPG of 21 and of 2020, hopefully not of 2022. (laughs) If if I have to handwrite and hand deliver every copy, it's coming out in 2021. (laughs) I I now want... (laughs) Andy, I now want a handwritten, hand delivered <laughs> copy of <laughs> Dune. Yeah. You can't, there's no take, yes. yeah, there's no take backs, Barry. You said it. It's, yeah. That's the law. This, you know, yeah. You, can't, yeah. you can't not do it. Uh, a special well, I, super mega limited edition just for you. Yeah. You can have the crayon version. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yeah. With, with your left hand. You're not left handed, yeah, are you? I am left handed. So. Uh, with your right hand, then. Uh, you wouldn't with know the right difference hand. if you saw my handwriting, to be honest. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so, June is coming out this year. Uh, so, what can, what's the sort of uh, stage it's at at the moment? What's what? Because I've seen a lot well, of bits and pieces. There's a, a preview out already that you can. Well, it, it's download. very nearly there. Yeah, we are we are putting the last touches onto the core book, and uh, you know, it will it will not be too far away. Um, you know, it's it's the usual thing, you know. COVID, you know, messed us up a little bit, like it did everyone, mm. and that just nudged it back a little bit. And mm. uh, but yes, it is very close to. It. The, I mean, like the um, yeah, it was, yeah, well, the the estate read the book in text form, and they're about to get it in nicely beautiful layout form, yeah. and. Mm. and um, most of the artwork's approved and there's just the final bits of artwork. So it's like those final stages. And of course, you never know how long the final approval takes because, yeah. you know, they're very fussy about stuff that's coming out, especially as the film is delayed. They want, you know, anything that's got June on it mm. gets loads of attention yeah. now. So, um, but it's good. They're great to work with. Got a lovely team working on it. And um, yeah, ho- hopefully everything goes to plan. But, you know, with the joys of Brexit and the fact that, you know, you've got container shortages in China because the dice are coming from China. And mm. the, if you can get a container, it's three times the cost. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, it's wow. completely ridiculous. Yeah. So that's, um, we're hoping that's, that's that, ridiculous. yeah, I mean, it's madness, but they've just, because all the containers are stuck in the ports in the yeah, West yeah. Mm. because they've been stuck because either companies are shut down or, you know, stuff isn't moving or whatever. So well, they've used yeah. it as an excuse not to, Except delivery. So mm. anyway, yeah. boring stuff. Boring yeah. logistics, but it's long and short of it. Hopefully, it'll be out on time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and, the, so I mean, logistics are key to any enterprise and getting it happening. Because if you don't have to, oh, I know, yeah, triple price and yeah. yeah. so well, especially when it's lots of different things. You know, we most oh. the print all the printed books are coming from one place in uh, oh. Lithuania. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our dear friends there, and uh, but then the dice. You know, unless you're making dice with Key Workshop. In mm. Poland, mm. all dice basically come from China. Yeah, and yeah. Um, uh, and it's you know it's not easy. So mm. no, no, no. So, well. so so when it does come out, what should we expect to see in that initial launch? Is the core rule book obviously? What else have we mm. got coming? Mm. Yeah, we've we've got some gorgeous things uh, all up on the website. You can check them out. So you got the uh, standard edition core book, mm-hmm. and we have three collects edition. Oh, I've seen covers. those. Yeah, yeah. Um, they are amazing looking. Uh, we have one for House Atreides, one for House Harkonnen, and one for the Imperial Carino House. And you can get them from different places. So Amazon will be the only place to get the Harkonnen one. Mm-hmm. We are the only place you can get the Atreides copy. And retailers, the only people you can get the Carino Ooh. copy from. So there's uh-huh. a little bit of something for everyone. So we did a um, special collector set of the just, here's everything. Here's one of each of the collector's books mm-hmm. and the stand edition core book for Workaday. You saw both the sets of dice, the GM screen. Mm-hmm. Um, and we thought, yes, I'm sure some people will want to get just everything. So we'll give them, an, uh, this is the only place you mm-hmm. can get everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, But we limited that because obviously we don't want, you go, oh, you just go to Modifius to get um, the limited edition from retail, you know. I uh, need to stick to that, and mm-hmm. um, and they were sold out in a day. I think wasn't it, Chris? I think twenty four hours. Wow. Yeah, wow. yeah, I think it was. Yeah, it was fast. All of those sets were just were just gone. Mm. Um, so uh, 
you can get the individual ones if you hunt around, uh, but uh, but not all in one place because it was an amazing deal. Yeah, you will be able to. I think it's October, is so everyone's exclusive for like six months. So mm. from October, you'll be able to order any book from anywhere. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you can only get the melange melange uh, dice mm. from us, oh, nice. blue ones. So that's the other special pre-order one. So we've yeah. got they've both mm. got the sort of worm symbol on them, and one is in a sort of Eyes of Eyes of Ibad, they're called uh, the Fremen Eye Blue, mm. at, uh, and that's going to be our special limited run dice you get with the pre-orders. But yeah. we also have the Arrakis set, which is the more sandy colour with the with the, with the sort of standard dice set. Sense, yeah. um, and uh, and we'll have more on the way for Ooh. for dice related things as well. Great. Um, and then, of course, the last two things are the GM screen, mm-hmm. which comes with its own booklet. Um, that's right. got all the loads of bits and pieces about running adventures, and of course. You'll see a gorgeous screen that's going to have the map of Arrakis on it, mm, uh, yeah. which is amazing. And uh, and then we have the Dune Journal that is a uh, really nice, um, gorgeous piece of work. The It's like the Vampire Journal that we've also had, mm-hmm. which is where it's not just a notebook. It's got uh-huh. your character sheet and your house sheet in it as well, and then lots mm. of different types of paper. So you've got square if you want to make grids, lined ones, and blank ones. Mm. And that's a repeating block, so you can get about five different characters wow. in, into that book. Um, and uh, as well as all your notes for Dune, if you're a GM, you can pull the notes mm. in. If you're a player, it's all your background mm. notes. Uh, mm. So it's a lot more than just a little notebook. And that, again, the same great design we've had from Chris Webb. If you uh, hadn't guessed, I stuff. like notebooks. <laughs> 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 he did them for Fallout yeah. and Vampire yeah. and... John Carter, etc. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. I just, think, I just, I think you can never have enough notebooks. I just, I get mm. twitchy if I don't have a, like a nice yeah. pile of unusual notebooks that I, are clean and fresh. I can't even go. remember the last time I physically wrote mm. something down with a pen. <laughs> it's got to be a while. And, uh, it's terrible. And if I do, I then want to type it up somewhere, so I've got a digital record. Yeah. It's for game ideas. I was just, I just yeah. scribble away yeah. game ideas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got oh, some yeah. uh, listener questions for you. Ooh, I asked, I asked yeah. on our Facebook group if people could ask yeah. you a few questions, and I said I promised I would read them out. So yes. we whip through those very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. The first one's a good one. This one isn't actually about June, but it's from <laughs> from Jessica Hancock. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And she the wants to know. Her. I know. Causing trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Some, kind, some kind of troublemaker, uh, rabble rouser called Jessica Hancock, who wants to yeah. know, what is Andy's favourite thing about D&D? <laughs> Well, as, as I believe I answered, I'm a big fan of Advantage and the lack of prestige <laughs> classes. Um, but, uh, we could do a whole show where we, where we could argue about D&D. So your favourite thing about D&D is the lack of something. Yeah. <laughs> well, so- to be fair, it was my issue with, one of my issues with third edition was mm. that, I mean, I like the idea of prestige classes, mm. but it always seemed that they were far too targeted. So mm. you had, I love the D20 Star Wars when that came out and said, right, be a fringer or a rogue have these very broad classes you can make into any character you like. Mm-hmm. And then five minutes later, a Star Wars comes out with, oh, here's your starfighter who can only do this starfight, this, this ship mm-hmm. prestige class, mm-hmm. super specific cookie cutter molds for your characters that I felt lost some of the broadness of trying to create a character and that is something unique and individual. Uh, so I'm a big fan that fifth edition particularly doesn't have so much, as far as I'm aware anyway, doesn't have so much, uh, of these, you know, super prestige class st- things and encourages you to I, work I st- with it. I still remember you lecturing me about. in a caravan yeah. in a new forest about yeah. how D&D yeah. wasn't You're still well scarred by that. Well, <laughs> that I, I will, by that. It was years ago now. I, but... I, will, I will support, before it, before you, <laughs> given that I'm in the wrong crowd as a seer in the world, I would argue it's not specifically a role-playing game, but a small unit tactical <laughs> war game that happens to lend itself exceptionally well to role-playing. <laughs> Listeners, um, don't email me. Yes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And I would kind of stand by it because its its roots are clear. That's does, it's not to say it's a bad game. I, as I say, I'm playing Dragonlance. I have me, I've spent many many years enjoying some spectacular D and D game. But uh, my disappointment with it is it still has its roots. Uh, and it because it was the first time anyone had this Ooh. idea. It's only fair. But it it its roots as a small unit war game mm-hmm. are very much evident still in the yeah you know, because they're now into its DNA. You can't you can't say oh you don't get a combat bonus per level. You, know, you can't do that because you are, you're stripping out the, DN, the DNA of mm. it, and, uh, and that's fine. <laughs> okay. Lee Donovan has a question. 
Hi. Lee Donovan would like to know if Dune will feature many of the other houses of the Landstrad and if House Ordos featured in the Dune computer games is included. All right. Well, that one, uh, yes and no for some of those. Uh, mm-hmm. You get to create your own house. Uh, as mm-hmm. For, for um, unaware viewers, the Landstrad is basically the collection of noble houses. It's the, the great council that they all serve, effectively. So each of these noble houses has a sort of vote on council. You'll create your own noble house, which can be a minor house, uh, someone you know just new, uh, maybe even serves one of the great houses, has a little area on someone's planet. But you can play a great house that has two or three planets under its control. Of course, if you do, the, the threat the GM, so if you're not familiar with D20, the threat the GM starts with is far more increased. So basically, the bigger and more powerful you are, the more enemies you have, the more people are lined up to take you down. Mm. So it's kind of exactly it's where you want to go. But we thought this is the thing with Dune. You know, mm-hmm. we didn't quite want to start it with, oh, you're, you're very much, you say, to use d first level and you've got to start with your tiny house. There's a lot mm-hmm. more games recently, things like, you know, Firefly and some of the Cortex ones where mm-hmm. they go, let's let you start as the big guy. Let's mm-hmm. rather than spend ten years building up to being a great house, let's let you start mm-hmm. there if that's where you want to place your game and your campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of variety, but you can still play the little guys and build your house in the same way if you want to. That's uh, so. As time goes on, we will expand more houses into the world, but you can create your own houses and populate the world as you as you like. I don't believe we'll be using House Ordos, given that that's a sort of non-canon house. It, you know, mm. it's, this is the thing with and I think Star Wars has uh, got a little bit of this as well that any IP or actually, that's been going this long um, mm. there's a lot of things that fans now consider that's part of the canon now isn't it we played these video games with mm. House Order mm. and uh, so they go oh yeah these, and they're, they're a really cool house you know, I, you know I think I always played House Order when I was playing that game to be honest yeah. mm-hmm. uh, but they're not actually canon so we probably won't be able to use that specific no, yeah. but there will be sneaky houses who are looking to backstab mm. people. Um, in fact, there are more of those than anyone else. So suppose players could recreate all... that house themselves. Absolutely. Games, if, you wanted, if you wanted to decide that you are House Ordos and create your house along those lines, there's absolutely no problem. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I so, suppose that ties in nicely to the next question, which is from listener mm. Christopher Helton, which is, will the game support playing in David Lynch's movie version of Dune? Well, Sort of yes and no. I mean, David Lynch used the same setting we did. So <laughs> it's it's yeah, the same setting. Yeah. yeah so, you know. uh, uh, I thought there was a qualifier yeah. in there somewhere. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a bit like Star Trek. You could you could literally yeah. take Star Trek and play Discovery mm. right now, and we're going to do a Discovery mm. line of products. But it's you're on an Enterprise, you've got phasers, you've got people in uniform mm. and teleporters and stuff, you know. I mean, it's, you know, there's not going to be um, the weirding modules. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not like there's a big paradigm <laughs> shift or anything, is it? It's still the same, yeah. same basic <laughs> concept and the same basic game. Yeah, we've, we've come back to Frank Herbert's novels primarily, but we are also using detail from Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson's novels as well. So we have access to all the expanded universe. And yeah, and we are using, we base some of our look on the new film that's coming out, uh, just also because it just looks superb. Uh, but we are also, we have to add, we are inspired by it. So we are not the place to go. You won't see our art and go, ah, oh, this is what this is going to look like in the film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. none of that. Uh, we've taken, you know, some inspiration from that. Uh, we've used some of their style, um, but we've made it our own, which is actually best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. We haven't been locked down to only what we can see in the movie is the only thing we can use. We've been able to expand uh, beyond anything we've seen. But yeah. at the same time, uh, we've got this amazing creative concept that uh, that we can base our stuff mm-hmm. on. Um, and it, it it looks great. I mean, you will have seen some of the art in our preview, so you can mm-hmm. already see the style and look that we've gone, gone for in that. Yeah, and, and the art uh, is all gorgeous. We're really pleased with it. Yeah. 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 So following up on that with the David Lynch's movie version of Jim, will you have stats for Sting's underpants? <laughs> Might be a fan supplement. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to buy too heavily into this one, but technically you could. Um, we have well, um, a, a lot of. I mean, I know you yes. were expecting this. 
I sort of, <laughs> and, but let me explain. <laughs> no, we don't, we don't uh, need any nuance to it. We don't need any, yeah. any caveats. I would, yes, that's yes. all we need to know. <laughs> I would recommend it, but your character's equipment and the like is based on having assets. So it doesn't matter that, you know, swords don't do 1d6 damage or anything. A sword is yeah. a thing you can use to hurt someone in a conflict. Just mm. as blackmail material is, just as a favour from someone is, and these are all things used. Now, if you could, fig- if you wanted to use your points to say, "I've got awesome under," <laughs> mm. um, and you could think of a way they would be helpful in a conflict, <laughs> possibly to intimidate someone or seduce someone, well, then I find, okay. I find Sting's <laughs> underpants are heavy intimidation. <laughs> I have to say. I mean, <laughs> there you go. So, I mean, te- so technically, and I emphasise and underline the word technically. Uh, you could potentially do that if you really, really, really wanted to, but I don't think we'll be putting it in the book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think that brings us seamlessly into the next question, which is from listener Shane Stacks. Will you have anything to do with the Kwisat Haderach breeding program failures? People in the June universe have extra powers because of it, but are not the Kwisat Haderach. Interesting which, idea. For those of you who are listening along at home and aren't entirely familiar with the setting, is a sort of a mythological figure that in the original books Paul Atreides, the dispossessed heir of House Atreides, uh, eventually ascends to. Yeah, so you've you've got this breeding program that Sisterhood of the Bene Gesserit have been doing for thousands of years that does, you know, spoiler alert, does turn out Paul Atreides as, um, as, the, as the ultimate version of that. And as, as I say, along the way, they have had some near misses. I believe uh, Count Fenring, the character in one of the early books is one of these near misses. Uh, I'd, also, I'd argue what the question is go, really going for is not specifically those guys. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't necessarily play that and justify that's where some of your extra powers have come from. But there are the sort of powers like prescience and uh, mentat conditioning and powerful ner- nerve um, control and reflex. These are all things that are available to player characters. You can play Bene Gesser and Fremen. Um, mentats and all these all these sort of strange powers are all available. Uh, how you justify how your character has got them or how they're as part of them, that is of course up to you. There's no reason you couldn't claim to be uh, one of the uh, Bene Gesserit near misses. It's a really interesting idea. Um, but uh, but yes, it's all available. To... So we've got a question here from Egg Embry who wants to know, will the core rule book cover all of the Dune novels or does it focus on a specific novel or set of novels? Well, that goes back to what we said before. Yeah, our focus is the Frank Herbert one. So obviously Dune itself mm-hmm. is the main book. Uh, we've also, because we are setting the core book in the Age of the Imperium, which is just before all the first half of the Dune novel, before everything starts kicking off in the story, there's this whole setup of the Imperium, the noble houses and everything. And uh, so the first three Brian Herbert, Kevin Janderson books, uh, the Prelude series, House of Trades, House Harkon, and House Carino, uh, they apply as well, very well, and um, because they're sort of set in that era. So yeah, there's a nice cross mix of those two as well, but it's it's that first half of Dune setting. Uh, for that. But we will potentially move on to other eras and uh, and look at Dune after Paul Atreides or in the 10,000 years post-scattering and all kinds of other things like this hmm. we move through. Okay. Uh, so we've got a question here, another another one from Shane, uh, Shane Stacks. He says, the religion in Dune is very interesting. Herbert combined Islam and Catholicism with the Catholic Orange Bible. Will the RPG get into that aspect of the world building or keep it more abstract? Oh, absolutely. It's That's one of my, I mean, I, I went back and did a degree in religion as well. So it's one of my Ooh. things. The there's a particular one of the things I love most about Dune as well is it is a very far future setting mm. where faith and religion is actually still important. Mm. It's often one of those things that people imagine that religion will just sort of fade away as we get more technological, but actually not so much. Mm. And um, it's so it's very difficult to avoid faith in Dune because you have the mm. entire setup again to sort of explain for anyone who's not too familiar with this, uh, where a lot of the setup setup of the setting has come was there was a machine revolution war uh, where mankind realized that they had basically handed over all of the control to Mm -hmm. machines. And then when the machine said, you're going to do this, they had to fight a revolution to free themselves from the change. So they've since created a a prescription that says, you cannot make a machine that thinks like a person. 
no more thinking machines, right, no yeah. AIs, nothing that nothing that could possibly take control. So there are mechanics, there is technology, um, but uh, you can't do this. So, and but this no is a AI, basically. Yeah. And there is an element that seeps through the whole book, which is on the basis of the what they call the Orange Catholic Bible, a sort of rewritten for the new new mega millennia of religious guidance that's all been put together. Uh, that says essentially it makes this prescription almost a pact with God. Right. And there are many people that believe that if people start making thinking machines, it will bring the weight of all this, you know, like divine wrath back on humanity itself. Because it was such a near miss thing, there is a certain element of people thinking we only got through this because God helped us out mm. or because we made this deal. Now, of course, this doesn't mean you can't have characters who are atheists and the like. You know, there's, it's not necessarily everyone is signs up to this but there's a very that pervades a lot of the setting because it's a lot of thing that makes people feel safe there are many people that are terrified of the idea of anyone creating a thinking machine and bringing destruction to humanity on a universal scale uh, so you can imagine how these things are you know are built up and held on yeah you know particularly as there are places like x and uh, and the like who push the limit a little bit and the telex oh, mm. um, they certainly push the limit on what they're allowed to do uh, which make people very known. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so we've got one question left, and this is from, uh, <laughs> this is from Angus O'Branson. That's oh, right. Another trouble Another, another, trouble. Yeah. 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 another, yeah. another yeah. Rouse, rabble, uh, rabble rouser, whatever that word is. Uh, he, uh, it's actually a two-part question as well. He's stuck in two here. Uh, oh. He wants to know, oh. how oh. does it feel to be voted yeah. one of the most anticipated games of the year for the third year running, and which games from other publishers are you most looking forward to this year? Ooh. Uh, I would say it's, I mean, there, there's an element of double-edged sword, although I think actually it really <laughs> just shows how yeah. how popular June mm. is. I mean, I believe yeah. the, the first, first year we hit the table, I think we'd only just made the announcement. Yeah. I don't think we'd even actually started working on the game. So it was. It wasn't really something that was expected to come out so in that year. Did you year. not and know there was an appetite lit. for it then, or was it a bit of a gamble? I think there's always been an appetite. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think we were pretty sure it was a bit like mm. a. I, I've always likened it to you know before Lord before the Lord of the Rings films. Mm -hmm. you know geek fantasy gamers knew about Lord of the Rings, but it wasn't really a broad thing, and it's a bit like right. geek sci-fi fans knew about. You know, um, June. I mean, obviously, there's a bit different because we all read The Hobbit as kids. We didn't read June as kids, mm. but it's that it's the movie that really brings it into the public eye. And of course, it, they've had a movie as well for June, so that you know it's helped. And it was so iconic that it, you know it's inspired stuff like Star Wars, Tatooine, and, and, and things like that. But yeah. so I, th I think there was definitely an expectation it was going to be big, and the movie was going to be big, and mm. but. It's not like, oh, well, we know Star Trek was really big when Decipher did it before, so it's it's going to be big when we do it. You know, it's yeah. it's always a bit of a gamble, and you you, know, you think it will do well, but how well, you never really know until people can actually put money down for it. Hmm. I mean, did you know the film when you first approached, uh, was it the Herbert Estate for the licence? Where did Well, actually, yeah, they actually came to us. Oh, and, right, yeah. And, you know, we got into all sorts of talks and... and um, and uh, Gale Force Nine picked up the master license. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then we were kind of one of the first people to work with them to go. Okay, we'll get, we'll start working on the RPG because it needs more time. Mm. But did you know the film was coming at the time? Or yeah, was that? yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause I'm trying to think of the timescales and when the film was announced and Gosh, when the game was announced. A, and trying to think back now, it's a couple of years ago. <laughs> When yeah. we actually, when we had an office. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> yeah, I Back in the before Back years. Of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we Those actually saw other days. people, yeah. The pre-apocalyptic <laughs> days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So can we talk a little bit about the system? Because uh, it uses mm -hmm. your 2D20 system, which you've yeah. used mm -hmm. for how many games now? Star Trek, Conan, uh, John Carter, Dishonored, yeah. Acting Cthulhu coming. Yeah. But you modify the system for each game, don't you? You don't just use it as is. So you yeah, make tweaks to the system each time. We do. Kind of, I mean, there's, there's everything from typically you're rolling two 20-sided dice to get under a number. And that number is either made up of your stat and skill added together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or, like in the case of John Carter, it's mm -hmm. your two stats added together. 
And, mm. and you can even decide which stats make the most sense. So Dejar Thoris runs around shouting at people and making them feel stupid mm. so that they drop their swords and run away scared, whereas John yeah. Carter bravely dashes in right, and yeah. swings his sword around in a very daring, um, but- fighty way. We, you know, so we, we, the team can make all kinds of changes to make the game work. You know, typically we also have this kind of threat slash doom pool that is points at the play, you know, a pile of counters typically. So players can give the GM more of these counters to buy more dice up to five mm. dice. So they've got more chances of rolling under their target number can get more, more successes that can do more cinematic stuff. And that do, that pool can change a bit. You know, the name will change what you actually do with the pool. Like there's a new game we're working on where um, we also have a thing called momentum. So if you get extra successes and you don't really need them, so rather than do extra damage or you can just save those successes into uh, momentum and then someone else in the group can use it which is a bit like you know that raucous speech or that you shot mm. him in the face so well that I'm going to punch him harder <laughs> <laughs> you inspired me to punch him harder um, so um, you know it's that you know heat of the moment where everyone's like quick I'm going to shoot him in the face so you like run harder and dive behind cover and I've got to say after know, having been shot in the face the punch is really good <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <That's right. laughs> follow up yeah so um it's a bit like a car company, I suppose. You know, like a Beetle and a Golf is basically the same engine underneath. It's just a different body, but it mm. just sounds cooler and it looks cooler, the Beetle, you know, depending on what you think. But um, mm. but essentially, it's the same machinery underneath that, yeah. that is doing things. So, we, yeah, it's the same basic core mechanics and system, but we we don't, you know, we try not to be too corporate. It's not like, no, it must do it this way and do you will die if you change it. It's like, look, just go make a great system and mm. mess with it. And, you know, essentially, as long as you're rolling two 20-sided dice because it's two, two, two d 20 yeah. and it has the, the, you know, this kind of um, threat pool, yeah. pretty much anything goes, really. I mean, yeah. I, I'm working on a, with another team that we're about to now announce soon, very exciting news, on a new version that's going to totally change things as well. So mm. um, I, I like the fact that we can do whatever we like, really, because yeah. which which messes with people's heads a bit. Because they're like, wait a minute, I just learned that last one, and like, you but just, it's similar, you it's similar <laughs> enough, but it's not like they're learning an entirely new game, though, is yeah, it? Yeah, no, that's real. And we try to, and what we are trying to do going forward is go, okay, for existing, if you know our previous games, these are the things that have changed in this book that you should be aware of, you know. Right, yeah. Yes, and that's so, added into the, the introduction in Dune. We've got, so, so talking of things that have changed in this book then, <laughs> so looking at Dune specifically, what, what have you changed for this game specifically? Well, the, the main one, I, th- I think, is the way we've done, as Chris said, you've got usually a combination of two attributes to make mm-hmm. your target number. Uh, and these are usually slightly different in each system. In Dune, we've gone for a range of skills and a range of drive. Uh, yeah. So this takes away that you don't have a strength or dexterity your character that's all kind of included in your skill the drive is why you're actually doing something so mm-hmm. is it because you want to take power is it because it's 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 the right thing to do um things like that now that means that you're you're adding a role play aspect to any skill role you make we're asking why you do which also adds extra feels and and, and thoughts as to how the scene is going to play out between you right. but the main reason for this uh, divorcing strength and dexterity from school system the skill system is that this allows us to do what we're calling architect and agent which is one of the things i'm a big fan of this game so agent play is when you're rolling skill points when you're being the people on the ground doing the thing so you want to go and kick a door in um you know it's why you're kicking in the door well it could be any number of reasons and you might use a battle role to to be fighter why are you fighting you know pulling a gun shooting some all of these you know picking a lock you can do all of these things with the skills as you have them however because we have this asset system, one of your assets might be a gun or a, a knife. It might mm. easily be a group of soldiers or an agent somewhere. And okay. that's the thing you might be sending in. Now, you still make the skill roll, but you could be on another planet when you're sending your agent in. So this is the, how the architect play works, where you can have almost like a round table. The player characters could potentially sit in a room with their characters manipulating like spiders in the web out across you know even the universe making the mm-hmm. same skill roll as if they were actually standing outside the door um, looking to get in so 
you've got that great mixture. It means you can play characters if you want to that are very hands-on and get involved, but you can also play the, the manipulative spy master in the background. Mm. Um, and it kind of reminds me when I ran, um, one of the few people actually ran the Chronicles of the Imperium um, game, the original Last Unicorn one a while ago. Uh, I had one of my players, uh, would always, he played a Mentat, and any time the characters went to go anywhere, he said, right, my character's getting into the security um, console and I'm going to watch them on the monitors. And he did that every time. And I had to say to him afterwards, um, after he'd done this for a couple of sessions, his character had just sat in this security area watching on the screen. So I said, you know, are you OK with how this is playing out? Because your character is, I mean, this is, if you're happy with this, this is great. But I just want to make sure I was giving you the right opportunities for you to play your character and mm. to get involved in the and he just loved being a Mentat so much. He was like, yeah, I, I don't have to do anything to be a, I just Being a Mentat is just awesome to me. Yeah. So now in our yeah. system, those sort of players can do something. He can be just as involved as they are because he'll be manipulating from the scenes. He'll break the same roles uh, and achieve the same things because he'd send an asset with the player character group. Uh, and that would be his involvement as well. So there's a lot of really interesting tweaks. Once you divorce those physical aspects of your character from the skill role, um, then uh, you've got so much more scope to do all kinds of different interesting things. Mm. So, is, is it is it fair to say that various D two D twenty games they kind of may vary a little bit on the sort of uh, narrative to crunch side, not massively because they're all still two D twenty, but if if they varied a little bit on, on on that scale, where would where would June sort of fall on that scale and that narrative crunch scale? Yeah, I think June's probably on the more narrative end of things. Uh, but I'm a, I'm a big fan. As you know, I'm I, I'm a fan of narrative play, but I'm also really? a big really? fan. Of, really, yes. <laughs> uh, but, but on the other hand, I'm also a big fan of structured narrative play. Um, mm. I'm, I'm just as frustrated with games that just go, oh, just make it up. Oh, just tell a story because you need solid examples. You need to give people a help. You need to give them a clear dice roll, a clear result from what they're doing and then let them role play a narrative ad on top of that mm. now we've got a lot of things in dune that you know i mean even just the way you do it with any d2 20 game when i've been running people spending momentum i've said to them well what does that momentum mean okay well i'm adding this because i gave him a really intimidating glare before i i leapt in with my knife it, so you know i'm a big fan of adding those things in but this is the the core of things you're always it's spending a point and if you want to just roll the dice and go uh, I've got that and that, and I roll the dice. Did I make it? Yes, you did. Moving on, you know, because nothing will stop a game quicker than someone going. I can't think of anything to say. And, oh, yeah, and yeah. You know, we, we tend to provide a framework. I mean, a good example is typically in two D twenty. What can you do on it in a turn? You can usually do a major action and a minor action. Major action, like you know, running, jumping, shooting someone in a minor action switching on a button or doing something like that. When I run it, I just go, what do you want to do? And I know as a GM when someone wants to do too much. Mm. And so I, I don't tell them, okay, everyone pick a major action and a minor action. I just right, go, yeah. what do you guys want to do? So really mm. it's down to the GM. And I think some groups like that mechanical framework and they want to know, okay, what's my list of major actions and minor actions? Because they want to not game the system, but they – some people want to have the exact framework of how they role play. Sure. You know? and yeah. I think, you know, you see that a lot more in D and D, but again, D and D players, I, when I role play D and D, I don't, I kind of forget half the rules. I just, you know, get them to, again, describe what you want to do and I'll tell you the results. Yeah. And, uh, and so we try and give them the basic framework in 2D 20, but any, you know, and actually we've got a, a big um, teaching seminar series coming up for 2D 20 for new GMs. So we're going to be teaching them, how to improvise, how to play the game as written from a rules aspect or how to play it more narratively. And, and, and some of the games like John Carter are very narrative, whereas Conan oh. is quite crunchy. It's very mm. combat, melee driven. So um, I think, it, yeah, a lot of it's down to the GM, really, like mm -hmm. with a lot of RPGs. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So what, what can we look like, look at in the, in the June 9th? So we've got this initial launch of stuff coming out. Is there going to be some kind of big, long campaign you're releasing, a bunch of individual adventures? What's the general sort of look of what's what's in the future? Yeah. It's quite a mixture, actually. We have got source books, campaigns, PDF adventures, mm. um, things, and all things that will develop the the game world. So we yeah. are focusing originally on Arrakis. As we say, it's called Dune for a reason. 
Uh, so your characters are agents of your house who have been sent to Arrakis to represent your house, increase the power of your house. Mm. Um, yeah, and they're the elite agents. They're not just the sort of, you know, couple of guys just said, Bob, Jim, off you go. It's, you know, you're the guys they really trust to get yeah. that done. And, uh, and as we increase, we add supplements and build on things, we're going to then expand out with more noble houses, expand off into, the, into other planets. Um, and expand into other eras as people want to play different things and gradually build the world up because it's, you know, across the known universe of 20,000 years of history, uh, we'd, if we, if we dumped all of that in the core rule book, you'd just go, ah, yeah, what, yeah. what, what is this? Um, yeah. if you're not new to it. So the people who, who are already Dune fans, uh, they can take what we've got and they can run, you know, off into the universe wherever they want to go. But uh, if you're new to it, we're giving you a solid basis and we're going to gradually expand that and add more layers to the onion as we go uh, and build it out that way. Hmm. Yeah. Is, is there an adventure that uh, people who buy the core book that they can start with? Is there one in the book or one that comes with the book? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, the, the preview that we've given out to pre-order customers uh, that has an adventure called Desert Fall in it. Mm -hmm. So if you've already pre-ordered with us and you can get a hold of the preview, we will send that PDF to you right away and that gets you something that's got player characters in it and all the rules you need and the adventure you can just get playing right away mm. uh, but the it is not the, the same adventure that's in the core book so you get another one when that comes out that involves you investigating some skullduggery going on on a spice harvester operation um, and then we'll have we'll be supporting more pdf adventures and, uh, and as we go as well Mm. And there's a quick start as well, isn't there, Andy? Yes, I Coming. wasn't sure whether you wanted to announce things like that for that, but we will be doing a, a different... <laughs> there's yes, always so, a quick start. Yeah. There's usually a quick start, yeah. 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 I think yeah. that's coming out after the... Um, I should, I'm not quite sure, but it's after the PDF is obviously finally ready and mm. a bit later in the in the pre-order period. Yeah. So, months so, or so, yeah. That will be the cut-down version of the system, and yeah. rather than repeating Desert Fall, which actually turned out to be a bit large, for a quick start it's quite a big adventure uh we've written a whole another new adventure called worm sign that's mm -hmm. a little bit faster and uh, a little bit quicker to get through and uh, and that's got loads of the iconic yeah. images so you've got a to, you've got like three kind of a whole adventures there that keep you busy on a yeah. rack which obviously is the, you know is the focus for the film and uh a lot of people will you know even if you've watched the old movie you'll have a sense of what the rack feels like you know whether it's the movie or the book or, or what you've seen of the new film. So that just felt like a really great place to start because it's it, with such a big universe, it's sometimes better to zoom in on yeah. where the action's happening. And of course, Arrakis is so important in the storyline. And, mm. and it feels like you get to play something quite pivotal in, at a pivotal moment in time. Mm. Yeah, and th there will be a host of scenario ideas. We've got the mm. GM's, GM's booklet is full of extra new scenario hooks and themes. And we've got a whole page of, yeah, several pages of NPCs. Each one comes with their own scenario hook mm. uh, to how to introduce them in the scenario. So the book yeah. is absolutely full of adventure ideas yeah. to keep you going as there well. Is, there are big campaign projects coming in the mm. background that are uh, in the works. Yeah. So we'll have more on that for another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to see you back, yeah. Um, so yeah. You, you, you mentioned that uh, with pre-orders, mm -hmm. people get a pre Was it a preview? preview. Of, yeah, uh, it's like so 82 what? pages of... Wow. It's not, it's not just a cut and paste from the rule book. It's kind of mm. collated together to give people the best experience. So it's like a it's giant quick start, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it feels yeah. almost like a starter set, almost. Kind of. I mean, you don't get yeah. all the rules, of course. No. So. Right. Yeah, but, um, but there's but there's people out there playing playing your game already. Even there are. Yeah. Not even, yeah. Yeah. yeah, even yeah. people doing some podcasts, mm. like wow. um, uh, actual mm. plays. The of course, as soon as the PDF is signed off for print, then mm -hmm. we're sending out the actual physical uh, PDFs. Well, physical the digital <laughs> PDFs to everyone, and in store. If you have um, pre-ordered by the 15th of January, which is an important date, if you order by the 15th of January, your store will be able to get you a copy of the PDF as well. So Ooh, which that's, just, that's like just later in February. That's just next week, I think, 15th of yeah. January. So yeah. we'll have to get quickly like on one that. block because it's, it's horrifically complex to, to organize, um, as you can imagine, to validate. So we're doing it in yeah. one big batch with all the distributors. But the bonus is, in the back of the book is a sticker with a code on it and you get another PDF. So 
you'll get a PDF uh, even if you buy it in a shop in five months' time. You'll get mm. a PDF for free, which um, we do with all the big books. I mean, everyone yeah. gets PDFs of the Modiphius published products for free with all our releases anyway. Yeah, I, th- I think um, that should be standard pretty much, to be honest. If yeah. you buy a physical book, let's just yeah. have the PDF for free. I mean, some uh, people don't do it still. I don't know, so, I know. Some people charge, yeah. charge extra for the PDF. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. And you see that on Kickstarters too. You see, because with, with mine, and I, I'm sure with yours too, I've always got like a PDF level and a yeah. physical level. But on the physical level, you get the PDFs as well. Yes, yeah. Always. But I've seen yes, some where they'll then have a PDF and physical level as well, which I always <laughs> I think, think it's a just, bit, yeah, a bit tight, seems really. To be making life complicated for yourself. So. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, Peter, you got any further questions on June? Ooh. Tricky. It's like, can I take oh, my hand out of this box yet? <laughs> <laughs> we have covered so much. It sounds like you've got the onboarding process so people can get up and get playing as soon as possible. It sounds like there's a lot of detail in the core rule book with a lot more to come. It really is a very exciting and, um, like, is it, can I, can I use thrilling to describe an RPG project? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and say. <laughs> we, we like it if you do, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's, also it's, it's a, you know, yeah. to stress, it's a great game. Obviously, yeah. it's been a challenge for us because we, it's the first role playing game where it's, it isn't a, you run around shooting people or hacking people to death. Yeah. It's, I mean, you literally can go and have a knife fight in a back alley if you really want, but the game yeah. is much more about, uh, both, uh, social and political. Mm. machinations as well as running around blasting people in a ruined mm. you know facility or something so you can the great thing is you can play it in both ways you can you can have your kind of far future dungeon crawl or you can have your far future socio political drama yeah. you know and it's yeah. um it really opens up a lot of new potential for play you know in the same yeah. way that kind of yeah. vampire was the first game to be like let, let's actually make this social side of the game way more interesting and i think mm. This is, you know, hopefully will, you know, be a big milestone uh, yeah. for a lot of role players to, to discover how fun that can be. Mm. I, yeah, think- I think that the thing I'd be most interested in is the way it's been described to me so far is it feels a bit like how Ars Magica has always been described to me in that you've got the potential to be someone planning what's going on whilst at the same time also role playing the people who actually go out and do things. Like, I know this might be a bit of a bizarre question, yeah, but I know I can tell you both got a lot of experience with a lot of RPGs. What's the game power. that you? What was the What's the game that you would most like to be compared June to be compared to? When Gosh. someone's saying you should play the June RPG because it's like X. That is tough. I mean, we've we've drawn some of the things from. I know Nathan's a big fan of Smallville, and and so am I. I think one of the most uh-huh. um, underrated games of all time, probably. Mm-hmm. So it's we've used uh, some elements that are very similar to that. Uh, I think you're quite right with Ars Magica, this sort of mixture of characters, and I think Dune would, it's not specifically designed for troop-style play, but there would be elements of that could easily work very well, um, because, say, Star Trek has an element of that where you can create, you know, quick people to join your landing party, and so there is, yeah. that's that's translated through. I, I really like that whole landing, that sort of the away party that you could form in Star yeah. Trek and have characters that you could, like, just create in space for it. That was always... A very good idea with that I found, yeah. Yeah. As long as I'd, I'd like to, I mean every every person says this, I'd like to think Dune is very much its own own thing. So I think there are oh, there are yeah. things you'll find that you're not going to find anywhere else. But then everyone says that about that. And then you discover that Greg Stafford wrote a game all about that 10 years ago. Um, so, <laughs> no. the, uh, it's the, all know, been done before. Yeah. John, <laughs> John Wick's Greg Stafford rule is usually does apply to anything you think you've done. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. He always did before you. Um, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's the same as. It's like, what would you like people to compare it to when you're saying, you should play Dune because it's like X? I think for me, I, I mentioned Vampire. I think mm. Mm. If, if, I, if in six months I heard that loads of people were doing LARP sessions where they were, you know, recreating, you know, events yeah. and um, political events or balls where they had to talk mm. to each other and figure out who was the, um, who was the traitor in the room, etc. I could, I could totally imagine that making complete sense. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and that you know, like Vampire was that first game that when mm. this isn't, you don't have to go hunting monsters or just dungeon crawling. Mm. It you, yeah. you can talk to each other, and and talking to each other could be really fun and unusual. Mm. And I think um, 
Whereas if you, I wouldn't say a vampire, oh yeah, you could literally dungeon crawl every session and, and it, it would probably twist what that game is about. But I, I think you totally could just do a dungeon crawl Dune game mm. campaign because it's set in a futuristic world where people kill each mm. other a lot. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's that game that actually has both sides of it uh, and you can mm. either have both or a bit of, of mix. But I, mm. I think that's what I would compare mm. it to is, is vampire in the sense mm. that uh, go off and and, uh, and have fun with the you know the, that side of the world. Mm. It's a really heavy social setting and the politicking. Uh, that, yeah. But yeah, I mean, again, I, I, I would stress that don't you know for those of you out there who who are used to hit punching goblins in the face every week you know which we all love our dungeon crawls so like yeah. if i was hearing that i might be like oh no maybe it's not for me but it's you know you've got these awesome las guns that basically if they hit a shield they make things explode like an atomic bomb and uh, <laughs> you've got uh, spaceships and um you know combat armor and all sorts of awesome daggers and shields you know so it's uh it's a combat environment and very dangerous and there's traitors around every corner and people mm. trying to poison you and the yeah. whole work yeah. so mm. it's um there's a lot of action if you want it that's the yes. that's the great thing about it yeah just thinking, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd add to that one of uh, probably game of thrones uh, the uh mm. well, the, rather officially these yes, kind of ice and fire yeah. rpg yeah. Uh, that green ronin did because that again mm. has you now they of course have you as a minor house from one of the big houses uh, mm. We had the option, of course, there's so many more major houses. We don't have to fit you into the structure. So mm -hmm. you go, yeah, you're one of the major houses. Um, Good idea. So there's yeah, yeah. Some extra bits there. But that sort of setup of you being servants of a house is also very similar yeah, to yeah. Uh, mm. the game. I mean, you could argue that Game of Thrones is, is drawn from some of the same sort of Dune. Yeah. Well, nice. the entire feudal kind of um, space yeah. feudal thing. Space feudalism. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was yeah, thinking yeah. if Dune if Dune was a D and D game, there would be stats for the big sandworms in the monster manual, and players would be <laughs> yes. going out to kill oh. kill the sandworms pretty well, much. I, I like right, where right where away. do you think purple worms came from? <laughs> well, yeah. 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 It, so, it's, but, Dune's been seeping into everything for since the. So do, do you have stats for the sandworms, or you just say no? They're this force of nature. They're too big. You and, can't. To a you can't have they a are, with one of those. You, you do encounter, obviously, in the worm sign adventure, you do have a bit of an encounter. Um, mm. They are quite mm. difficult to use because they will just consume everything. Yeah. Um, mm. it, it's you versus the sandworm, it's over. But well, having said when, that... When you, need to put a, when you need to put a mountain in the way to slow it down a bit, yes. that's probably a sign that maybe yeah. you should yes. reconsider your option. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> having, said, yeah. having said that, there are, you know, depending on what you're trying to do with, you know, trying to escape it, trying to move away, mm. trying to get it to go somewhere, um, to those things it. are, you know, or even ride it, yeah. yeah. There are, you know, that would be roles you can make. So you can you know, certainly mm. get in track. I mean, that's the one that we should, should add about this, where you have uh, one of the most difficult things the setting is you have these iconic characters like the Bene Gesser, the Mentats, the Fremen, uh, and it's very easy to assume that those are going to be the really powerful. Mm. But we should add that if you don't want to play one of those, uh, all of the agents are still elite agents. There are plenty of cool talents and abilities to go around. Yeah. Uh, so you can play these iconic characters, but uh, everyone's going to be have cool things. Mm. To, as you'll see in our the pre-generated characters in Desert Fall as well. So, yeah. uh, and it was also an attempt to get those iconic characters to make sure that they don't become cookie cutter characters. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what we've done, the, the leaf I, if I took anything from Chronicles of the Imperium, it was one of the things I particularly liked with that was that Mentats, for instance, have three different um, powers. They can remember things. These are your human computers. Uh, so they can remember things, but also they can process things, they can predict things. As well, so there are you can focus on different things. So if two people play a mentat, um, they can do different things, which mm. has been a very important part of creating these iconic characters. Bene Gesserit sisters, they don't all have to be caught, they can be knife fighters, bodyguards, spies, agents. You know, that's you know, yeah. it depends. You know, the faction characters, as we're calling them, uh, the iconic ones, um, are still just as varied as any other character. Mm. Right, so I think we need to wind up now. Yes. Cool. So, uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. This, yeah, it's fun. This does sound like quite the project coming home. It does, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess what I should be asking is when is it going to be out in the shops? Uh, oh, yeah. End of April. 
Ish. In the same <laughs> place, <laughs> game. Ish. <laughs> I for global game. events. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and the second question is, which, yeah. which of your games is going to be the most anticipated game of 2022? Oh, all of them. Oh. All of them. Oh. We're going to get all of them. in the top 10. <laughs> well, yeah. first. we should come and talk to you about something very special that's coming. That's our because we've got two whole new IPs launching this year and next year that are for oh, finally you guys just not never licensed stop. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's nice to get back to creating and not licensing. Yeah. So that's the big thing. So, but, it, you know, of course, you know, it's licensed stuff that often gets the big attention. But I hope, yeah. I think the one mm-hmm. this one that we're working on for next year mm-hmm. uh, is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Yeah, and I always think it's always important to have your own in-house IP as well because licenses will never last yeah. forever. Yeah, by definition, no, exactly, and it's not yeah. yours. So, well, there's always another license, I suppose you could say. Well, I suppose so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's nice to uh, yeah. I mean, of course, you get to be very creative with any license, but yeah, it's nice not to have to ask someone is is it okay if I put like a giant gun on this thing mm. or like you know change this so uh, it's all down to us which so is all the licenses that uh, Modifius has or has had and there's quite a few of them which which ones speak to you two like personally the most I, I guess it must be June for for Andy just because that's what he's working on but yeah. is that the same for you Chris or I'd probably say Star Trek because yeah, that would be mine too I'd, yeah you know, I, I remember sitting on the cross-legged in front of the TV watching Captain Kirk punch people that seems to be a common theme tonight isn't it <laughs> yeah um <laughs> or kiss kiss aliens or punch aliens is yes. or do a forward roll <laughs> past them leap to his feet and then do a double-handed <laughs> yes yeah star trek is such a i mean it's like just household name and mm-hmm. you know and especially with discovery and picard it just goes on and on and on yeah um you know, it's a, it's a wonderful universe to play in, and it took about three years to get the deal. And I couldn't believe it when they finally went, "Oh yeah, re- you'll you'll get the contract soon." I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> um, so did you have just, much of a Star Trek gaming history? Did you play like the faster one back in the eighties? No, never no. played any of them before. I played um, a bit of I think Starfleet Battles back in the day. Oh god, Hex, yeah, okay, yeah, hex based game, yeah, and just lots of Star Trek video games mm. so i'd never actually role played in in the star trek ah. universe so ah. it was quite Ooh. nice and i'd never read any of the previous books i think i bought a load off ebay and gave it to the team but i yeah. never actually read them because i wanted to have a fresh start with it mm, um yeah. like you know we weren't using any photos which all the previous games had used and mm. um well the pre with the decipher one yeah yeah you know, so we wanted a different feel look and feel to it so yeah, but yeah, yeah. It, and the fact that we you know, we picked up Discovery and Picard was is brilliant fun because it's a new audience and new ways of exploring the story because Picard is basically post apocalyptic Star Trek, you know. Mm. Let's and destroy Robin. the Federation. And yeah. Robulans. <laughs> Big Romulan yeah. fan. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well yeah, yeah, just, yeah. 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 And you get Romulans, yeah. Cool. Mm. Mm. Right. Awesome. Okay. Anyway, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you guys on. Ooh. Thank you so much. Please yeah, do come thanks. back when you want to announce that new thing, whatever that yeah, exciting sure. new thing yeah. is. Yeah. Um, next week, we have the people from Pinnacle Entertainment Group who are producing Pathfinder for Savage Worlds or Savage Pathfinder. I'm not sure what the official title is. One of those two things. <laughs> They're going to be coming on next week to talk all about that, which is going to be Ooh. super, super exciting. I will have to go then. Apparently, I now have to read this to you. This is the official podcast of Morris's unofficial tabletop RPG news, which you can find at enworld.org. You can find show notes at morris.podbean.com or wherever you found the podcast. If you feel like they deserve it, you can support the show on Patreon. In return, you will receive exclusive bonus content. Just go to patreon.com slash morris. If you're interested in his babbling nonsense, you can follow at Morris on the Twitter. Send your emails to morrispodcast at gmail.com. Not all of your emails, just the ones you want us to see. Mm, That's it. I'm bored now. You can go away. Shoo, off you go. Goodbye. Get out of here. Oh, God, just imagine if my dog was invisible. What a nightmare.
<laughs> well, you'd, you'd see it by the damage it did to your sofa. Yes, you? there is that. There is that. And you you always know where it was. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you hear that, Hudson? We're talking about you now. Uh, <laughs> I mean, where's the dog? Oh, there he is. Yeah. Eating the sofa. Come on, then.